in talking about the adaptive immune system, we've already seen that there's a couple of actors. Let me write this down. Adaptive or specific immune system. Adaptive immune system. You have your humoral response. Humoral. So this is responding to things that are floating around in the fluids of the body, and not necessarily things that have infiltrated your body cells. And then you have your cell-mediated. Cell-mediated response. Cell-mediated. And then in the humoral response, and we're talking about specific humoral response, this is where the B cells, the B lymphocytes, are at their most active. And essentially what they do is you got a B cell here. It has a very specific antibody specific to just this B cell, not B cells in general. If this happens to be the one of the billions of B cells that happens to have the matching key, or maybe I should say the matching lock for the key that is the intruding pathogen, that pathogen will bind to that B cell. Maybe it's a virus, maybe it's a bacteria. And then the B cell will get activated. And we'll talk about in this video that the activation doesn't always happen. In fact, it usually doesn't happen just from this. But so far, we've said it gets activated. It goes into memory cells, memory B cells, which are essentially multiple versions of this original B cell, just saying, hey, let's have multiple versions of this, because it tends to recognize this virus. So in the future, if we get this virus, those multiple versions, those memory cells, are going to be there to, do, to have this interaction. This interaction is going to be more likely to happen in the future, because I'm going to have more of this variety of B cell. And then you have effector cells. Effector cells. And these are essentially, so both of these are B cells. So this guy, once he gets activated, he proliferates. He keeps dividing and cloning himself. The memory cells just stick around, waiting to be activated in the future. And I'm only drawing one of these membrane-bound uh, antibodies, but there are actually 10,000 on, on the, I mean, I could draw a bunch of these. You know, I don't have to just draw one. The memories just wait around in the future, but there's more of them now. So in the, in the future, if we get this virus again, there's the, the reaction, the this interaction is going to happen faster. And so they're going to get activated faster. And then the effector B cells essentially turn into antibody factories. So they just start, this antibody goes in, or, or it says, let me just produce, I've been activated. Let me produce many, many more versions of that exact antibody. So they get spit out. I mean, I drew that one a little wrong. So that exact antibody that can then be spit out to go disable or tag antigens, and, and not just any antigen, this antigen. This antigen right here. And we also saw that the other thing that the B cell does is it becomes an antigen presenting cell. So what it does is, as soon as it recognizes this, it's been it's been it's had this interaction with an antigen that just matches the variable portion of its membrane bound antibody it endocytoses that it brings that into itself it's going to be membrane facilitated so it just kind of pulls it in chunks it up and then presents a piece of that antibody on an mhc2 molecule we saw that in the last video so it takes it cuts that up and presents a piece of it right there. And that's why we call it an antigen presenting cell. Now in this video, we're going to talk about why we even have these MHC2 molecules. What are we presenting these antigens to? And so we're going to start talking about the cell mediated. And actually, even more than the cell mediated, we're going to talk about T cells. So we're going to talk about T cells. And I said in the first video, they're called T cells because they mature in the thymus. Mature in the thymus. And there are two types of T cells. And it's all very confusing, because you have B cells and T cells, but then there are two types of T cells. You have helper T cells, helper T cells, and most people just write T with a lowercase or subscript H there. And then you have cytotoxic T cells, or T cells that kill other cells. Cytotoxic T cell. And that's T with a subscript C. Now. Just so that you have a big overarching impression of what does what, B cells, when they are activated, 
they generate antibodies. That's at 30,000 feet. That's the best summary of what an activated B cell does. It actually generates antibodies. Those antibodies attach to viruses and bacteria and other types of pathogens and disables them. Either tags them so that other uh, so, so that macrophages can go and eat them up, or it, it just by uh, throwing all of those antibodies onto the surface onto the surface of the pathogen in question. It might disable the pathogens or essentially bundle them all together so that it'll be easier for macrophages to pick them up. But this is only effective for things that are floating around. Antibodies, free-floating antibodies, are only effective for things that are floating around. Cytotoxic T cells, which I'll cover in more detail in a future video, these actually attack cells that have been infiltrated. So this is attack, kill, infiltrated, infiltrated cells. And when I say infiltrated, it could be a cell that a virus has gone into or some bacteria has penetrated it. And when I say infiltrated, it doesn't necessarily even mean something from the outside. It could even be a cancerous cell that shows itself to be abnormal in some way. And so the cytotoxic T cells will at least attempt to kill them. But what I want to focus on, so if you want, out of the three types of lymphocytes, these are, remember, all, all of everything we've been talking about is leukocytes, white blood cells. But lymphocytes are a subset of that. And these three are lymphocytes. And they're called that because they began their development in, in, in the bone marrow. So this guy, so this guy, and this guy actually do stuff. This guy generates antibodies that to attach to pathogens floating around. This guy directly attacks cells that are broken in some way. They've either been infiltrated, they're abnormal, they are cancerous, who knows what. And I'll do a whole video on that. But that, that, that leads us to a very obvious question. What does this guy do? What does the helper, the helper T cell do if, if he doesn't directly interface either with pathogens or produce things that interface with pathogens, or if he himself doesn't go and directly kill cells? And the answer is that the helper T cell is kind of the, the alarm of the immune system. And on some level, it's almost the most important. So we talked already about in the last video about antigen presenting cells that either when a macrophage or a dendritic cell uh, takes things in it cuts them up and presents it on its surface as these MHC2 proteins or in complex with these MHC2 complexes or proteins and so do B cells B cells they get attached but B cells are more specific now once something is presented now the helper T cell can come into the picture so this is a Let's draw a, let me do a dendritic cell. because, And I'm doing dendritic cells actually on purpose, because dendritic cells are actually the best cells at activating helper T cells. And we're going to talk about, in a second, what happens when a helper T cell gets activated. So let's say I have this dendritic cell. It's called dendritic, so it looks like it has dendrites on it. So the dendritic cell looks like that. So I have this dendritic cell here. It's a phagocyte. It's already consumed. Let's say it's already consumed a uh, some type of bacteria or virus, and it's cut it up, and now it's presenting kind of the body parts of that virus on the MHC2 complex. So this is MHC2. It's kind of its way of saying, hey, I found this shady thing floating around in the body's tissues. Maybe someone ought to raise an alarm. Maybe something. Maybe this is part of some type of bigger thing going on, and some type of alarm bell has to be released. And that's what the helper T cell does. So let's say this guy, he's presented it. He says, I found this thing. I killed it. Here's a part of it. The helper T cell has a T cell receptor on it. So let me do. Let's say this is the helper T cell right here. So this is a T helper, and it has a T cell receptor on it. And the T cell receptors bond to, and I'll be very particular here, so this is the T cell receptor. Draw it like that. It's just a protein. But like the, the membrane-bound antibodies on B cells that are very that every B cell or almost every B cell has a different version, different variable chain, that's also true of helper T cells. That just like just like the B cells, this has some variation in where it bounds. So this right here is going to be variable from one helper T cell to another. For example, I might have another helper T cell here that also has a T cell receptor, that also has a T cell receptor. 
But the variable portion on that T cell receptor, the variable portion on that T cell receptor is different than the variable portion on this T cell receptor. So this helper T cell will not bond or not bind to this dendritic cell or the MHC2 complex of this dendritic cell. Only this one would. And the mechanism of how you get this variation is very similar to the mechanism in how do you get the variation on the antibodies in the B cells. During these helper T cells development, at some point, the, the genes that code for this part of this receptor get shuffled around. And they get shuffled around intentionally so that each T cell has a certain specificity to a combination of an MHC2 complex and a certain polypeptide, a certain part of a virus. So only this guy is going to be activated, not this guy. So this is why we call it the specific immune system. Now we said, what does a helper T cell do at that point? Well, at this point, once he says, hey, gee, I happen to be the, the, the one helper T cell that can bond to this guy, this antigen that's presented, it becomes activated. And I won't go into the details, but in general, dendritic cells are the best ones at activating it, especially a naive T cell. Let me use that word's important, naive. A naive helper T cell. In general, when we talk about a naive B cell or a naive helper T cell, these are cells that are non-memory, non-effector, that have never been touched by, they've never been activated in the case of a B cell. They've never been activated by something bonding, binding to their membrane bound antibody, or a naive t helper T cell is a non-effector, non-memory helper T cell that's never had anything bound to it. So if, a, if this guy is naive, and then he, gets, he finally gets, he has a reaction with this, this, this antigen presenting cell, he becomes non-naive. He becomes activated. And when activated, two things happen. Well, just like with B cells, they, he proliferates many, many, many copies of himself. And some subset of those copies differentiate into effector cells, effector. An effector just means it does something. It does something now instead of saving the memory. Effector helper T cells. And then some subset of them become memory. Memory helper T cells after getting, it, after getting activated. Now the memory T cells, just like memory B cells, now you have more copies of this, so in 10 years in the future, if something like this happens, this interaction is going to be more likely to happen. This guys have the same T cell receptor as their parent. This guy has the same T cell receptor as the parent. Actually, both of these guys do. This guy does as well. It's just that the memory T cells, or actually even the memory B cells, they last longer. They don't kill themselves. They'll last for years so that if 10 years later, something like this starts presenting itself, you're going to have more of these guys around to bump into this guy so that you can raise the alarm bells. And this guy's also going to have, he's also going to have the same chain right there. So you're saying, fine, I have these memory cells. They're going to stick around so that this reaction can happen in the future. But I still haven't answered the question, what does the effector T cell do? What the effector T cell does is it raises the alarm. It starts releasing, let me draw an effector T cell, that same effector T cell up there. It's been activated. So this is an effector T cell. It has been activated. And it's remember, this is very particular. Only this version of T cells, but once it got activated, it produced many copies of itself because it says, hey, I'm responding to a particular type of pathogen. So that this is a helper T cell. This is an effector. And what these do is they start releasing these molecules called cytokines. So they start releasing cytokines. So it starts releasing cytokines. Let me write that down. Cytokines. And there are many, many different types of cytokines, and I'm not going to go into detail in all of that. But what cytokines do is that they really raise the alarm. So if you have other activated, other activated lymphatic cells or other activated immunological cells, when they get, when the cytokines enter those cells, remember, cytokines are really just proteins. When the, when the cytokines enter, or, or polypeptides, when, when they enter those cells, it makes them get in gear. It makes them uh, uh, multiply more often, or it makes them uh, uh, get more active in their immune response. So what this does, these cytokines, you can view as chemical alarm bells, chemical or peptide alarm bells. Alarm bells. It, it tells everyone to get get in gear. 
So that's one role. And so you can see this is actually a very central role. And it'll, it'll tell both activated cytotoxic T cells to get in gear, which we haven't talked about yet. And it'll also tell B cells to keep proliferating. So when an activated B cell gets some of, so this is an activated B cell. When it gets some of these cytokines that maybe come from a local helper T cell, it'll tell it, hey, no, divide more often, divide more often, only if you've been activated already. And we'll talk more about why you know, it has to be that case, because you don't want all the B cells to be activated. And then the other thing that the effector T cell does, in the B cell discussion, I said, OK, you know, if I have a B cell, if I have a B cell and it has its membrane-bound antibody, has its membrane-bound antibody, and remember, this is a particular version. It has its particular variable chain right here. And then this guy binds to a pathogen. So this binds to a pathogen. Maybe it's a virus right there. Up to now, I've been saying that this guy is activated, and he's going to, well, once he binds to the pathogen, he'll take this in, and he'll take part of the pathogen. He'll take part of the pathogen and cut it up and place it on an MHC2 molecule. And we've said then he'll be activated, he'll proliferate, and he'll differentiate into memory and effector B cells. But that's not quite true. This first stage happens. This guy bonds. This B cell happened to be specific to this virus, cuts up the virus up, puts parts of the virus on its surface, and presents parts of the antigen. But in most cases, this B cell isn't yet activated. It's just in kind of this, you can kind of view it as in this resting state, ready to be activated. But it hasn't started proliferating and differentiating into effector and memory molecules yet. And in order for that ha to happen, in order to, for that to happen, a helper T cell, a helper T cell, an activated helper T cell that is also specific to this very same virus. So you can imagine someplace else in the cell, this virus was eaten by a dendritic cell. Was eaten by a dendritic cell. So I'll draw a dendritic cell like that. So this exact same virus, this exact same species of virus, is eaten by that dendritic cell. And so the dendritic cell eats it up, it cuts it up. And then it presents it on an MH. It's an antigen presenting. So it presents it just like that. Then this will activate a very specific T cell, maybe that one. So then that, so the, a very specific T cell will come and bump into it. Not just any T cell, the one with the right variable portion. So think about what's happening. The variable portion for this T cell, the variable portion for this T cell, it's re, it connects to this part of the virus plus the MHC2, but it's really reacting to the same virus. It might be a different part. This little part that was cut off might be someplace inside the virus, while the epitope for the B cell might be someplace on the outside of the virus. But they're both specific to the same virus. Now, the, once this guy gets activated, and he starts producing memory and effector cells, or they're descended from him, one of those effector cells specific to this virus are needed to come bind to this guy. So then this guy can then go along and bump around and then eventually end up here. And then he is also specific to this virus. So this binding site right here is the same as this binding site, this combination of antigen plus MHC2. And so when this guy binds, so just like that, when he binds, and remember, this binding site is the same as this, and it only binds to this combination right here. This is what activates the B cell in most cases. Some, this is T-dependent T activation, which is usually the case. There's sometimes all you need is this first thing. But in general, you need the first thing. And then you also need a T cell to come and activate it. And only then will the B cell get activated and start proliferating and dividing and differentiating itself and producing when its effector cells will produce a lot of antibodies. And so there's a natural question. Why, why do biological systems, or why do we have this double system? And at least my sense of it is it's a fail-safe mechanism. Because if you only, if every time a, a virus came and attached this, this guy just started going crazy and producing antibodies against this thing, there's some chance there's some chance that maybe after development, this guy, this, this, this chain right here, or his genes for generating these chains, become specific not for foreign pathogens, but maybe they become specific for self 
molecules, molecules that are naturally produced within the body. And it's just a random mutation. But if he started going crazy for that, then he'll start, his antibodies will start attacking molecules that are naturally in the body. And then that could really hurt. That, that's, uh, that, that's what causes autoimmune diseases, where your own immune cells start activating yourself. But if you have this double handshake system where this has to happen and this has to happen, the likelihood of both of these guys becoming, after they leave their development stage, becoming specific to a self, to a self protein or a self cell or a self uh, molecule is very unlikely. So it kind of inhibits this guy just going from wild, even if he has some type of a mutation. Anyway, hopefully that explains a little bit of what helper T cells do. We'll, we'll talk a lot more about it. I know it can be a little bit confusing. In the next video, we'll talk about cytotoxic T cells. This is cytotoxic. I spelled it wrong in the first when I wrote it.